Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. You'll have to excuse the rain, but if I wait for the rain to stop, I may not film for the rest of the week. So we have to put up with the, the ambient noise level. <laughs> Quite honestly, the garden could really do with it. Me personally, I can do without it. Um, but anyway, uh, as I say, if I wait for the rain to stop, I could be waiting a long time. Um, I thought I'd have a chat about um, the Oncidiums. Um, these are the two that were bought to grow in the home. I've only brought them out here because the light level's so bad indoors I'd never film anything. Um, it's not that good out here, I come to think of it. But um, these were the two that were bought to grow indoors and to keep our eye on as, as home-growing orchids rather than um, out here in the grow room, in my case. Not everybody's got those sort of facilities. Um, as far as these two plants are concerned, um, this plant is quite a strong plant, um, pure luck rather than judgment. As I said, these were bought based on pretty blooms at the time from the selection there without picking them up and looking the plants over or checking what's in the pot. None of that was done at the time. Um, so I'll put this video in the Oncidium series and um, it's basically a, 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 a mini care guide I will say. Um, just some guidance on the types of oncidiums you may well find in the supermarkets and you know that sort of place, garden centres and do-it-yourself places, you know, the sort of places that are not really orchid places like um, nurseries or things like this. Um, so we'll have a look at these uh, plants first of all. Now the first thing I want to go over is light um, because I've got that wrong. Uh, for a fair part of this year. Now the colour, I hope the camera is going to render this otherwise it's going to make this part pointless. The colour on this plant is good. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a mid-green. Um, that's the right sort of colour for most Oncidium types. This one over here is a little dark. Oh we've got a spider. Well, he can stay. Well, if he chooses to. <laughs> the trouble is these could have been imported. That could be a foreign foreign spider that's going to grow three foot across. <laughs> it won't be allowed to do that. Um, but as long as he just stays around there, you know, some spiders do some good. They eat other bugs. But these leaves are a little dark as far as light is concerned. I can't tell you a light level. All I can say is that the Oncidium types need good light. And all I can do is compare that with what Phalaenopsis types need. They don't need good light. They need an average light and they'll do okay if they don't get enough light. Um, they'll do better if they get the right amount of light. And that goes with the Oncidiums as well. But in the Oncidium Alliance, Alliance there are a lot of variables and this is where you come into problems. So all you can do is go by the colour of your leaves. Yeah, Good green, nice mid colour a little dark but some of the Oncidium intergenerics have naturally darker leaves some have naturally paler leaves but what I want to do is switch from there over to here quite quickly these are too pale these are the ones I was told off about so these were up in the roof yeah and the light's got at some of these leaves to such an extent it's taken the colour right out of them. So the green's never going to come back on a leaf once it gets like that. There are signs of excessive light all over that particular plant. Yeah? The colour of these leaves is better and these leaves will recover and get their colour back. Um, down here is a Miltonia too near the roof, yeah? But the new growth is coming on okay. And these are a mid-green. They're still a little pale. I'd prefer them a little darker. But um, as it's a new growth and it's now down out of the roof, um, these will colour up to their correct colour for a Miltonia. Miltonias do tend to have slightly paler leaves than some of the other Oncidium types. Um, where else can we go? <clears throat> There's another Miltonia here. Now, 
This one, because it had spikes coming and blooms open, was moved down out of the roof a while ago. And this has already got its colour back. Yeah, so this has already got to a suitable green for a Miltonia. Um, but if you look at the uh, coloration of the pseudo bulbs, they're all a yellowy colour. Yeah, um, a hint of yellow on the pseudo bulbs is not bad, but you know they've shown signs of getting too much light. Now over here is a brassier type. Now these like high light. So you'd have a job to give that one too much unless it got direct burning sun on it. A good mid-green colour. Slightly lighter colour here, these are the new growths. They will darken as the leaves age. So that's got a good colour on it. That can take the light. And it's in the wrong place at the moment. It needs to go up there. I'll sort that out in a minute. Um, now coming over here, we've got some that have had too much light this Miltonia here. That's too pale, far too pale. And that's the Miltonia sunset. Um, and it was put in a place suitable for me to view the blooms. And it got too much light while I was enjoying the blooms. So not so good. Um, the Soto Anum over here, that is effectively in the same light as the Miltonia was in. And this one's okay. This one's taking the brighter light. Very, very slight paling, but not enough to worry about. Um, this is all coming into spike all over the place at the moment, so, um, so it's a happy plant. Um, the only thing I will say is that the time of year now, excessive light just isn't going to happen much anymore. Now, that strong sun's gone now, so we've lost it. Um, some Miltoniopsis down here. Um, too pale, too pale, better, better. But the Miltoniopsis have different colored leaves to the other Oncidium types. They have a grayish green color to them. Um, so it's, it's, they're, quite honestly, they're a bit more difficult to judge because they're not the same green as the other um, Oncidium type leaves are. They are a genuinely different colour, and they do have a, a greyish green tinge to them. But again, they shouldn't have any yellow tinges within them, otherwise they're getting too much light. So um, um, if you look here, bad, that's had far too much light. Um, it was up there near the glass, yeah, and up there even when the sun's highing the sky, it still comes in through the side as well as from above and then goes around there and comes in from that end as well. So it has high light in the longest days. Let's wash the colour out. Um, this is about to start some new growths now, so it's not going to be like that long. The um, Shelob Tolkien, too much light. Got paling leaves, they should be darker than that, yeah? And the telltale sign is the leaves are, are going to be affected first, followed by the pseudo bulbs. And they will take on a yellow colour, like that. Now these have still got their green, slightly yellowing, and the leaves that go first are the little bract leaves around the base. Um, they will go a bright yellow, like, where'd it go? <clears throat> Uh, like this. Let's have a look at this Miltonia again. You see the little bract leaves around the base of the plant. Yeah? They go yellow first, followed by the pseudo bulbs and the larger leaves. So watch your light levels and the leaves will tell you because it's, it's difficult to say this is enough light or this isn't enough light. But if you've got really deep green leaves, um, chances are it's not getting enough. If they start to pale or get yellow patches, you've probably overdone it. So somewhere in between, the, you know, it, it is, it's a judgment thing. And unless you do a sudden change, if you, if you take an orchid from, say, a, a garden centre that's been growing under artificial lights that are nowhere near sufficient and it's been there a while, and then you put it in really bright light all of a sudden, your leaves will pale quickly because it's the change that's done it. So no dramatic changes with light levels. 
Always do everything gradually. So if you think you need to increase your light a bit, do it a bit at a time, not in a sudden move. Don't take it from a dark corner and put it on a sunny windowsill in one go. Yeah, so. Right, back to the two. So that's light levels. Good light, but not too strong. You can overdo it. And if you're not giving them enough light, the leaves will stay quite dark green. Um, and you, you often find you get spindly growths as well. You know, uh, it, it affects the growth. They become sort of spindly and, and weaker because they're not getting enough light. So that's that. Um, watering and feeding on Cidium types. Some are incredibly vigorous growers. This one is. This one isn't. Uh, that one is, this little one isn't, yeah? So they vary a lot in, in, their, in their vigor, in, the, in the, the amount of new growth they'll put up and everything like that. Um, but th this sort of rule applies to virtually all orchids. When in active growth, feed and water well. When they're not, don't. <laughs> just one of those little things that you can you can do it in one sentence I'll elaborate a bit um, what feed and water well go steady with the media yeah these need a media that drains well that's got some air in it they don't like being in stuff like this in our type of environments they may do fine in the nursery where they're brought on from seedlings but um, Longer term, this stuff's not good. It's a peaty, fibrous stuff. And that was watered over a week ago, and it's still soaking wet. Now, okay, at this time of year, that's not too bad. In the winter, that would not be good. That could cause root, lot, root loss. Um, this one over here is in a similar substance. Um, this one is using its water and its feed more than this one is because this one's virtually finished flowering now. This spike's died back, the blooms have gone. The blooms on this one are just starting to go, so that spike's not gonna be around much longer. After it's finished blooming and the spikes are taken off, see this one's dead, this has died back, it's gone brown right down there, so that can be trimmed there, yeah? This spike is still green and it's still got some blooms on. But given the speed that that one died back, this one probably will as well. So once the last couple of blooms have dropped off, that spike will go brown quite quickly. Once those spikes are taken off, with a lot of Oncidium types, it will trigger the plant into thinking it needs to grow. Yeah, It's done its blooms, it didn't get any seeds, it wasn't pollinated, so its survival is now geared up to getting some more blooms to give it another chance. And the only way it's going to get some more blooms is to produce some new growths. Yeah, so this will come back into growth in the not too distant future. This one probably isn't going to push up any new growths for a while, but it might do because it's a vigorous one. So sometimes you can get bulbs that are fully mature with their spikes on and they still push out a new growth long before the blooms are finished. That's the vigor in the plant. Um, that's more exceptional than the rule. Okay, so I always tend to say that, um, you know, like this has got loads of spikes on it. This spike's finished now. It's, it's not going to open any more blooms. That would be better taken off. Yeah, because the plant's still trying to do something with that spike. There's still energy coming up that spike. It'd be better if it was taken off and the energy went into other places where it's more useful, like down here, where there's still buds to open. Yeah? So, on this type of one, this would apply to twinkles as well that have lots of spikes with lots of blooms on. As the blooms are finished on a spike, take the spike off. But watch out for little branches. Um, if you look on this spike here, this spike's finished, but if you come down here, there's a branch down here, here, and here, and those buds still haven't opened. So don't go too mad. <laughs> uh, right, so um, feed levels for Oncidium types, um, I would say average, medium. They don't need really high levels of food. 
um, but they need a good supply of feed while they're actively growing. And again, there will be periods when nothing's happening. This one is going to have that very soon. It will have finished its blooms and it's got no new growths. So what's it going to do with all the feed I give it? It's probably just going to sit in the pot, isn't it? Yeah. So there comes a time when they don't need as much feed. Hardly any, in fact. This one needs to be allowed to dry in between watering from now on until it starts those new growths again, at which point we'll repot it, and that will go in the series. Same applies for this one. That will get repotted when I see some new growths coming, which I don't see at the moment. All the growths that are on here are in bloom, the new growths, so they're matured or virtually mature. So new growths to follow. Um, media for Oncidium types depends on the root structure. If you get like a, a twinkle, or some of the twinkles, not all of them, they've got a very, very fine root system that appears quite fragile. It's actually quite sturdy. <laughs> but it's very fine. Um, they do better in a finer mix. Yeah? But some of the Oncidium types have really big, thick, fleshy roots. They do better in a mix that's got more air in it. A larger mix. Now, I only use organic media, so it's going to be bark and moss or just bark. It will never be just moss, I don't do that. Um, I've found it doesn't work very well for me in my environment. It dries too flipping quick. <laughs> Adds workload. <laughs> um, but basically a finer rooted system, I would use small bark with some chop, you know, some broken up sphagnum moss to hold some moisture, but still allow some air and allow it to drain reasonably quickly and dry reasonably quickly. Um, on the larger rooted ones, I may head towards small bark and medium bark. Maybe with some moss, maybe not. It's a judgment call at individual plant level. And quite a few of my Oncidium types are mounted, so that, that's, a, that's a different thing altogether. They, they quite like being mounted, but it would take a pretty big mount to actually mount that now, and it would take some holding on to the mount. Oh, that rain's getting bad. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not out in it. Um, so again, you know, I, this one needs to be potted. If I bought it as a small plant, or if when I repot it, I divide a bit, if I take a small division off, that could be mounted because its weight wouldn't pull it down. Uh, I'm going to stop for a bit and rejoin this in a minute. That's just getting too loud now. I'll be back. And the silence was deafening. Uh, rain's eased off now, so we can carry on. Um, where did we get to? We did light, we did feeding and watering. Um, as with all orchids, the purer your water, the better. Um, if you can get rain water, that's probably good. I use RO water, which is pure, um, distilled water. There's various options. Um, I would only say that tap water is okay to use if it's a very soft tap water and you've checked it with a TDS meter. I would say that tap water that goes much above 100 parts per million is, is, is probably not so good, simply because the parts per million is already high. And the higher it is when you start, you're going to get up to silly levels when you start adding a suitable amount of fertilizer in, a, in there. So the closest you can get down to zero for your parts per million as a start point, the better. Rainwater is usually quite pure. <clears throat> um, feeding levels for mine, um, certainly during the growing season with the longer days and the better light and everything, um, I feed at around 150 to 200 parts per million. I do occasionally go a bit higher. Um, my base fertilizer is the MSU fertilizer, which gives me everything I need as a base, but I do use additives as well. And at the moment, since I brought my, mil uh, my Oncidium types, mainly Miltonias, down out of the brightest light, I'm adding some magnesium in a bit more often, magnesium sulfate, um, Epsom salts basically, to help green them up, because that aids photosynthesis. It's one of its main functions, along with some others. Um, so uh, I do use additives. Um, <clears throat> I always make sure that everything I, I, I use has got calcium in it because um, my RO water has none. 
um, and calcium and magnesium are um, their secondary major um, elements. You've got your three, your NPK, and then those two sit underneath. Now, if you're using tap water, you've probably got some of those two in there anyway, but I wouldn't guarantee it. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, the purer your water, the, 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 the better you know what you're doing, if you see what I mean. So um, I use um, calcium nitrate to up my calcium level. I occasionally use CalMag, which is a combination of things. That's got calcium in it. It's got magnesium in it. It's got some iron in it in a suitable form for absorption and in my case it's got a very small amount of nitrogen in there as well. So that's a bit of a mix that one. Um, so I do use additives and I also use a seaweed extract, extract in low doses occasionally, not frequently. Um, if you overdose on that type of um, well, I won't call it a feed because it's more it's more about getting some hormones into the plant. It's a sort of growth booster, that root booster, that sort of thing. It's not really a feed. Um, the, the, the seaweed extracts are a, a helping hand, I would call them. Um, if you get your levels too high, you, it will often produce distorted blooms because um, you're pushing too much, too many hormones in there. The plant's not quite sure what it's supposed to do with them. Um, so don't go too mad with that. Um, as a guide, if I was adding either my magnesium sulfate um, or my calcium nitrate, I would set my parts per million of, for my MSU at around 150 and, that, and then add either of those two in to take it up to around the 200 mark. And if I add my seaweed extract in, I allow that somewhere between 20 and 30 parts per million on top of that. Yeah, But the goal is to have an overall feed level, irrespective of what's in it, if you see what I mean. So if you think your best feed level is 200 parts per million, then if you're going to use additives, make sure that includes them and they're not on top. Otherwise, you could start getting up a bit high. These don't need high levels of food. They just like a nice constant supply, especially when they're in growth mode. When they're not doing anything, they don't need anywhere near as much. So that's feeding levels and water. We've done light. <laughs> done light to death, haven't we? Um, Temperatures for Oncidium types. In amongst the Oncidium Alliance are some cooler growers. Um, the Odontoglossums, although they've been reclassified as um, uh, Oncidiums now in the main, some, some went a different way. Um, they are cooler growers naturally. The Miltoniopsis are cooler growers. For some reason, Nellyilas also like to be a bit cooler. Yeah? So these don't need high levels of heat. Some of them will take it providing they're kept hydrated and they've got good air humidity and air movement. to get The air movement helps keep the leaves a bit cooler, um, distributes the heat away from the leaves. Um, they all like a bit of air movement. I wouldn't say it was essential, but it will benefit them. Um, but they don't like sitting in a draft. <clears throat> so a bit of air movement's good. Um, humidity levels for most Oncidium types you can get away with sort of 50 to 60 percent. Some of them prefer it a bit higher. Again, the Miltoniopsis come from cloud forests, so they would be used to very high humidity levels. They like a bit of extra. Yeah. Um, humidity trays in the home can do the job. Get a little microclimate around your plants that you know from the base of the humidity trays, which is what I've done with these two. Um, so that's that. Um, some people say, oh you can raise the humidity by spraying your plants. Well a light spray probably does them no harm, but watch where the water goes. What we don't want is water getting down in places like that or places like this and sitting there for any length of time. If you're going to spray your plants, you need to ensure that it's going to dry and it's not going to sit there as a puddle in any shape or form. Um, it's just a breeding ground for bacteria and stuff if water sits. Um, if you've ever had a look in a ditch in one of your forest walks or things like that, when you find a section of water that just sits there, it goes stagnant. It's horrible. 
and it'll have all sorts of things in it <laughs> and it smells yeah we don't want that do we so uh, if you're going to spray your plants a light mist won't do them any harm but don't leave them soaking wet and don't get water puddling in places where it can be stored and can't escape yeah so that applies to all orchids really so, so that's that um, repotting these uh, again an emergency repot you just have to get on and do it so if you've managed to buy yourself a plant and you've had a look and the media is absolutely disgusting and your roots are rotting that's an emergency if you leave it it'll just get worse it doesn't suddenly get better it gets worse yeah um, these two are in media that I don't like but it's not breaking down or rotting or smelly yet so they can stay where they are for a bit um, <clears throat> but um, repotting is best done when you see new roots growing and that will vary from plant to plant you'll get some oncidium types will push up a new growth and when it gets to like about an inch inch and a half long um, whatever uh, three four five centimeters long you'll see the new roots starting to grow well let those roots get going a bit because they're, easy, they're easily broken off when they're, when they're only a tiny little stub on the base of the uh, new growth. Let them get to about an inch, inch and a half, so you can see them. You know where they are and you can take care of them when you do your repot. And then the plant will get going quite quickly with hardly any, if any, setback at all. Yeah? Some oncidiums, their growths need to get to quite a good size before the new roots come. And some of them don't grow their new roots until the new growths are almost mature. So you can't guarantee, just because you've got some new roots starting, that the new roots are going to follow immediately after. They can take time. If you think, if a new growth takes two or three months to mature, yeah, you could be waiting that long before your new roots come. So use your eyes. Make sure you can see new roots advancing from new growths unless it's an emergency. <clears throat> uh, we've done media, adjust it to your root size, you know, thick fleshy ones need a chunkier media, the thin fine ones, um, you know, need a finer media. Um, I'll give you an exception, because it is an oncidium type, not necessarily one you might be growing in your home, but watch your telumnias. They are, were once called equitant oncidium, so they are in the oncidium alliance, but they're now given their own genus, alumnias. These don't like their roots being buried in anything. Um, they grow on twigs. The roots are hardly ever found in anything. They just hang on to the twigs and they get most of their moisture from morning dew. Um, they will grow in a pot, but I would suggest the best expression for those is not what what to grow them in, it's what to grow them on. The roots like to be on things, they like to grab hold of things. They'll grow on rocks, lava rock, large pieces of bark or charcoal, but they, they like it there to hang on to. What they don't like is their roots sitting in things, especially if it stays wet for any length of time. They like a fast wet dry cycle. Um, some of the more vigorous oncidiums would prefer never to dry out at all. But again, is it in active growth? With mine, if they're in active growth, I try not to let them get dry. I try to water them before they get to that dried out point. Um, I do forget sometimes, or whatever. It doesn't hurt them that much. But keeping them moist and hydrated is good when they're in active growth. When they're in a dormant phase, <coughs> I would suggest they are better left to dry right out and then watered. Yeah, um, because they're not going to be doing much with the water and also at that particular point if they're in a dormant phase where they're not growing they don't need the feed either so that can be dropped right down so that's that um, I think that's probably about it um, and, and that looking after on the oncidium types can apply to quite a few other types of orchids as well there's quite a few dendrobiums that can be grown in exactly the same way um, but with the Oncidium Alliance, <coughs> the thing to watch out for is the blooms. So what I'm going to do now is put some pictures up of some blooms and suggest, even though some of them I know what they are, 
what would probably be in the makeup of the intergeneric involved, the idea being that you can identify at least enough about the plant to give you an idea of its temperature range and its light level and, and its requirements. You can get quite a lot from just looking at the blooms um, by their shape, their size, things like that. So uh, we'll stop this one now and switch over to looking at some stills and I'll put a soundtrack onto it. Okay, so the brassia types, the spider orchids. You've got two species on the left, those are true brassias. The others are intergenerics. You'll probably recognize the top right, that's Shelob Tolkien. Um, the one in the center top is a Banfield aria or something, gilded tower, mystic maze, and the other one I've forgotten. Um, but you can see there is a distinct look here. Even with the intergenerics, you can see there's a good portion of Brassia in those three intergenerics. Um, so typified by the spidery look, long dangly petals and sepals, um, often really good colours and intense patterning on the lip. Um, now Brassias can take higher light, they can also take better heat. Yeah, So they're up the higher end of the light requirements. So anything that you get that looks a bit spidery is probably going to need a bit more light than some of the others. You can't guarantee these things with the intergenerics because it depends what else is in there. Um, but the general shape of these blooms is quite typical. <clears throat> they're quite easy to spot, often quite large and often very fragrant so they, these these types are well worth having but be warned some of them can get incredibly large as plants go in the Oncidium Alliance some of the largest are in the uh, Brassia and Brassia type intergenerics right some true Oncidiums although I had a coffee while I was filming this so they probably changed their names again um, You've got Shari Baby in the centre. Um, you've got our um, house plant bottom left. That's the, oh, I've forgotten the names. <laughs> um, you've got my um, Vericosum top left. You've got uh, Sweet Sugar down at the bottom. Um, and that was Oncidium, it's now something entirely different. Um, got the Soto Anum, the delicate pink one. And then in the top right, I included a Tolumnia just so that you can see it alongside the other Oncidiums and you can see distinctly in the Tolumnia shape that you can see why it once was an Oncidium. Um, if you can get hold of one of the dancing ladies, the bright yellow ones, multiple bloomed, lovely branching spikes and many many blooms, they're well worth having. Um, some of the species are growable um, Soto Anum is an incredibly vigorous and large plant despite its delicate little pink blooms. Yeah, so Shari Baby, one of the best fragrances around <clears throat> if you like chocolate, if you don't, probably not. So there's a distinct shape to the Oncidium, true Oncidium types. Yeah, they're pr quite easy to spot. Now, Miltoniopsis are the pansy orchids. They are one of the easiest to recognize. They have some incredible colors, some incredible patterning, like the sort of splash pattern on the left. Um, yellow is a bit unusual. You don't come across those so often. But there's whites, pinks, purples, reds, all the colors there. They're all fragrant. And these are cool growers. Yeah. Um, Miltonias and Miltoniopsis are technically the same thing but the Miltoniopsis come from cloud forests so they like n nowhere near as much light as the others. These are lower light orchids, they need to stay a bit cooler and they shouldn't dry out, they're, they're, they suffer a bit. So that's the Miltoniopsis. Um, if you have a look now at the Miltonias, there is no distinct look here they do vary. If you look at the, um, the one on the left, it's quite a different shape to the one on the right and the Miltonia Sunset center top. Um, so these are not quite so easy to spot. And once they start getting hybridized with other things and become intergenerics, it becomes less and less obvious that the Miltonia is in there. 
Um, but you know, when you get something like a Bratonia or a Miltasia, it's it's got some of the Miltonia in it, um, and it depends what else it's mixed with. Um, but there are a lot of intergenerics containing Miltonias. Um, you won't very often come across a species in, in the sort of places you're going to buy. Um, that's probably just not going to happen. So, but they're mixed in with the intergenerics a lot. Um, Miltonias, reasonable light. Now, center and the two on the left are Odontoglossums. My favorite one, top left, Odontoglossum crispum. And some of the others. The two on the right are intergenerics. I think the top ones are Sturbic, something like that, and the um, bottom purple one is Mil. I think it's um, Melissa Briony. I think that one's called from memory. But the Odontoglossums have a look about them. They've often got frilly edges to the petals and sepals. Um, they're more delicately covered, although I wouldn't call the two intergenerics on the right delicately coloured. But um, if there's odontoglossum in an intergeneric, it will cool it down and it will in instigate a lower light requirement. Um, the odontoglossums are quite cool growers in, in their true form, but these are mixed in a hell of a lot and they've all been reclassified. So they're, they're nearly all called on oncidiums now, so we've lost that ability to tell the difference. I've stuck some Nelly Islas in because these just keep popping up all over the place. They're not the easiest to grow, but if you get a good one with a good, good root system and maintain that root system and don't lose it, they're not bad. Um, but they are classed as a little more difficult than some of the others. The bottom left one, I think, is the classic form. Um, the top right one was called um, Nelly Isla Orange, and the one on the right is the one I still have, which is um, Red Velvet. That was a relatively new clone um, within the last few years. These are all fragrant. Um, they have a, I, I call it a lemon fragrance, you know, a citricky lemon type fragrance. But they've all got good fragrance. They all have a look about them, but they're not all the same. Some have got patterning on the lip. Some have got very little. Um, their leaves are slightly greyish green as well. They're not the normal sort of green. And then probably the best intergeneric I've ever owned, and I've, it was just labelled Cambria. And, you know, nothing else. That's all that was on the label. <clears throat> I would suggest that's got Odontoglossum in it. <laughs> Quite heavy on the Odontoglossum. Uh, although there's no definitive way to tell, you know, without a proper name, you can't look it up, you can't find what's in it. But um, as colours go, it doesn't get much bolder than that. Um, that one I just average the care out because I don't know what else to do. So me medium-ish light, you know, good light and... Uh, average temperatures that's all you can do so i hope that little bit on the end is a sort of help to trying to identify the type of thing you've got when you end up getting your plant home and it just says orchid if you're lucky or it might say house plant or it might say cambria or something like that okay i'll see you next time thanks for dropping by